Good morning. Since no one said anything, I assume you can't hear me. Good morning. Good eye. Good eye. Yes, thank you. Good eye. My apologies to the Aussies, but nonetheless. So my name is Daryl Davidson. Uh, I am with uh, RoboNation or the AUVSI Foundation, whichever of those two names you want to use. We use them both. We're using RoboNation more and more, as you'll see with the branding, mainly because it's fun. Uh, it's more meaningful to what we do as an organization, uh, and also because the old AUVSI acronym doesn't have quite the same meaningfulness in the academic world or in the robotics community. So anyway, welcome to the first ever Robotics Forum. We've put together all of the normal hashtags. Uh, this is an audience, I think, that probably uses social media more than a lot of traditional conference audiences. Uh, we envision and view that the RoboTX community is a bigger part of the RoboNation community, and the dialogue and the exchanges that happen through that uh, are easiest and best done through social media. It's unfortunate that we can't just meet somewhere in the world once a month and do this and just keep having these conversations and keep having the great presentations and sessions like the Ross tutorial yesterday, and thank you, Brian, for that. Uh, we just That's not efficient, it's not effective, so social media is going to become the link between all of us. There are dozens of other teams out there that we're not able to send teams here or teammates that are interested and that we expect to see uh, participating in future robot X's. And so social media is going to be how we want you to interact, to ask questions, to provide feedback. Uh, that's very important to us as we go through this. The other part of it, which may seem a little bit disjointed, is that make sure that I had a note on here that said phones off. Well, phones off means you can't social media, right? So how about ringers off or go on silent or vibrate or whatever you want to do but definitely keep your phones on and communicate. Uh, and that's just the new norm, and that's what we want you to do. All right, so let me jump into flying over here, long flight, sitting next to a guy, and we started talking about what I'm coming over here for. And his whole thing is, you know, people do things perfectly well. Why do we need to take people out of the loop? Why do you want to put robots in the mix? Why autonomy? That wasn't how he asked it because he didn't know what autonomy was. And so it occurred to me that we're in the midst of this. We know the answer to that question, but there's still maybe a handful of people here that have snuck in, uh, Luddites, people that don't belong, that question why we're even here in the relevance. And so it reminded me of some things that I've seen over the years that I'm just going to put this whole debate to bed. So the first slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I have the button. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Right? Why autonomous? Because of humans. Okay, I hit the button. There we go. <laughs> this is not very smart. Humans obviously can't hit buttons. Right, okay. Tell me that automation can't fix that. It, there's a degree of cleverness to this, but it's the two guys standing on the middle forklift that kind of are just as curious as anything else. This is when you just don't have the ladder that's quite long enough, and the second guy that's up on the pole, too. This is actually my favorite. <laughs> I, I have no idea what the guy in the pink shirt is thinking other than, I mean, it's, it's selfie time, right? You know, I'm in a biohazard event, and everybody else is dressed for this, but I'm going to get in the picture. And this is the ladder's long enough, but it's not the right kind of ladder. Last but not least, you're putting a lot of faith in a two by four. So this is why we are here. And this is why all of you are working on technology and software and systems 
that will prevent, hopefully as much as possible, as much as Darwin himself will prevent a lot of this from happening continuously, um, eliminating this kind of bad behavior, the bad decision making, and it really is the wave of the future. We were talking at breakfast this morning. I can't wait to go crawl into a car and just lay down in the back seat and know that it's going to take me from point A to point B. Uh, there are some great, wonderful things happening with this technology. Um, you are all on the cutting edge of things that are going to change and affect our lives and the lives of generations in the future. And I think it's very exciting. And I'm looking forward to all of the things that come out of this. And remember, community, dialogue, and let's make this as interactive as possible. Please do not interpret this as a normal conference where you're just going to sit for two days and talk during the breaks and then go back with all your great ideas. We really want you to participate in real time, OK? All right, so let me introduce the first part of this. And some of you have been involved since, in fact, let's do a quick show of hands. Cameras don't have to catch this. How many of y'all were involved in 2014 Robot X? Okay, that's a pretty good group. I'd say roughly half the room. Um, this thing has been on the books and started long before the 14 competition even began. And as we were going out socializing this uh, to all of the countries that were originally invited, it occurred to us that we need to put together a high level message of why we're doing it at all. And our great crack video team at Five O'Clock Films put together a video that I think really captured the essence of what Robot X is all about. And let's roll the video. The C and its mastery was one of the greatest contributors to human civilization. Learning to navigate its waters provided exploration, food and resources, trade, and migration. We've come a long way since people first ventured off their shores, but in many ways little has changed since they bravely pushed off for the first time in wooden vessels. Putting to sea still remains unpredictable, dangerous, consuming, and expensive. We've been sailing for thousands of years, but we've also been hurting people for thousands of years. The ocean is really, really dangerous. It is one of the hardest environments to operate in. The energy is the most powerful, huge waves and storms to deal with. In some ways, it's much more in the ocean than in deep space. According to our research, about only 5% of the oceans are mapped. And there's so much that we need to know about the ocean from a whole range of reasons to do with weather and to do with climate. And right now, we don't know a lot about what's going on. From the shorelines to the subtitle to the deep waters, we simply will not get all with manned vessels. They're too expensive too limited in what they can do. Ships are awfully expensive. Depending upon the ship, uh, 25 to almost $40,000 a day. But there's so much, so much more to understand, and observation technologies really are needed to be out there in the midst of it. It's a vast frontier for discovery. What will truly change the game out in the oceans is the ability to access those vast areas without needing people on board and all the support systems that are required to keep those people safe. For every application that we currently do with crewed vessels, there are many more that are only feasible to do unmanned. But in order for these unmanned surface vessels to be successful, a lot of difficult problems need to be solved. And for that, we need to nurture the next generation of innovators. When a difficult real-world challenge presents itself, how do you inspire people to dive right into the middle of it and tackle the whole thing? One way is to hold a competition and invite the best of the best from around the world. The Pacific Ocean is the world's biggest ocean, and the Maritime Robot X Challenge has brought together teams from five countries who most depend on it. Australia, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, and the United States. These countries will send three teams each to attempt challenges that mirror those in real-world applications. The challenges in the competition are, are exactly the challenges we have in the real world. They are critical things that need to be solved in a reliable way. Because there are not many commercial uh, USVs at the moment working, we're going to learn a lot from what the students can. Depending on the ideas that come out and how they solve some of these problems, there's a real chance that some of these ideas will actually perhaps become industry standard at some point. This is a very precious chance for them to get exposed to those kind of work, which cannot be easily done through some class work. For the last few months, I've been traveling to all of these countries 
to see for myself what unmanned surface vessels are being used for now and will be in the future. And what I found has spanned the gamut of maritime applications. Things like search and rescue, shipping security, environmental monitoring, fisheries management, and marine science. Using this type of technology is going to transform the way that we do science for all this, the future students. The students will be learning something about a field that is just starting to open up. Experience counts. I believe that through the process of challenging maritime rubber desk competition, every participating student can have invaluable experience directly related to the core technology of USVs. If the Robot X Challenge throws up new products that will enhance the capabilities of the USVs and solve some of the difficult problems, I think that's something to be a proud of. Could we see the next big technological breakthrough in unmanned surface vessels at Robot X? Could the students on these teams ultimately be responsible for overcoming some of the biggest hurdles in developing the future of seafaring vehicles? If they brought us something we didn't predict yet, expect yet, it is this the competition's fruit. RobotX.org will have daily recaps, a live webcast of the finals, and a more comprehensive look at my travels figuring out the bigger picture of the special applications. All right, on RobotX.org, we've got a very extensive video library of things that have been produced over the last several years. That is actually a five minute version of that video. There's another one that's longer than that. Uh, if you've never seen them, it'll help you in gaining support for what we're doing. Please utilize those as much as you'd like. Um, so that's the, the context. That's the bigger context of why this event ever came about. Uh, but it's the people that made it come about that are really important as well. And you'll hear from Kelly Cooper in just a few minutes. But back when this idea was just germinating, uh, there was a gentleman named Admiral Nevin Carr at the U.S. Office of Naval Research, and he was the chief of naval research. And it was under his watch that this whole thing got started within ONR and within our, Singapore, our friends at Singapore uh, in the Ministry of Defense. And so Admiral Carr could not be here with us, but he recorded a message for us. Good morning and welcome to the first Robot X Forum. Uh, my name is Nevin Carr. I used to work at the Office of Naval Research with Kelly Cooper, uh, who is one of your moderators and uh, originally started this event when I was on active duty with the U.S. Navy. Uh, now I'm also affiliated with uh, AUVSI, the organization that is helping uh, run this, and Daryl Davidson, who is also one of your moderators. Uh, my greetings to both of them as well. Uh, thank you for making the investment in time and resources, and thanks to your parent institutions, whether they're schools or governments or companies, uh, that have helped you to uh, come and attend this event. Unlike the competition every other year, this is uh, an important forum for you to come together and exchange ideas in a free and open manner uh, to collaborate, to learn from each other, and get to know each other. Start building those networks that are gonna be important to the research that hopefully you'll continue to do through the years. I'd like to share a little of the history of this event with you. Uh, when I was with the Navy and with the Office of Naval Research, uh, we felt it was important not only to help advance the science of autonomy and robotics, but to also help stimulate STEM activity, science, technology, engineering, and math activity uh, among the schools and particularly uh, universities, colleges, and high schools. So events like this uh, are very, very important Form for you to come together and learn and cooperate and collaborate, but then also to compete. Uh, nothing pushes uh, the boundaries of knowledge like competition. When it comes to emerging and disruptive technologies, the things that will shape the way the world is in, uh, in the years to come, uh, there are a short list of things that are truly going to change the world. Certainly artificial intelligence and the internet have already done that. I believe autonomy and robotics are going to change not only the way we move and transport things in ourselves, uh, it's certainly going to change the military and it's going to change commercial applications in ways that we are just beginning to think about today. 
That's why you're so important and why what you're doing is so important. Now that I'm uh, retired from the United States Navy, I'm in industry and I can tell you that industry is very, very interested in how this is gonna change, not only how we make things, uh, but how industry can capitalize on it as well. So have a great two day forum. Thanks again for making the investment in your time and resources to come and attend this event, to make it better every single year, to collaborate and cooperate, exchange information and learn from each other. I uh, hopefully look forward to meeting you and seeing your teams in competition next year in Hawaii. Uh, but for now, it's about collaborating and exchanging ideas. Uh, congratulations to those of you whose papers were selected for presentation at this forum. I hope you have a great two days. Thank you. All right, thank you, Admiral Carr. Uh, without further ado, now I get the opportunity to introduce Kelly Cooper. Uh, most of you have probably, the first time you met me, you probably met Kelly. First time you met Kelly, you may have met me. Uh, I have the great joy of spending a lot of time with her. We have traveled all over the place that she'll talk about a little bit. But Kelly is just a delight to be around personally. And she's also just tremendously invested in these types of programs. And so that makes her near and dear to my heart as well. Kelly Cooper. Good morning. Thank you, Daryl. You said that with a straight face. I knew you would practice last night, so <laughs> well done. I want to talk to you this morning uh, about how, the, how we got started. What were the origins of the ideas for RobotX and how it has evolved over time? I thought about starting this presentation with the Star Wars saga far away, in a gal you know, long ago in a galaxy far away. It wasn't that long ago, but it seems quite a while ago. Um, which button do I push, Daryl? The green one. Okay. Yay. So the way I hear the story is these two guys were at Singapore National Day on August 9th, and there's, there's a picture of them there. Actually, I think Mr. Quack had an, a, a real picture of them seated together, but with not the background, just the two of them. And they uh, both talked about having mutual problem of uh, not enough students entering uh, particular fields. And this isn't really a STEM issue. Uh, it, it isn't an issue of getting students to go to college or be prepared to go to college. It's These are students that are already selected engineering, math, science, and technology. And it's attracting them to be substantive contributors to the field of robotics, uh, maritime robotics, to the fields of autonomy. And uh, they, they sort of commiserated and talked about it for a while. And uh, Admiral Carr came home from his trip, and he called me into his office, and he told me he wanted me to work with the ONR Global Office and a gentleman named George Lowe at the time who was with the Ministry of Defense in Singapore. And we began back in 2010, 11, to start talking about doing something. Next slide. Uh, I can do that myself. Okay. Did I break it? Okay. Oh, now I went too far. <laughs> All right. About the same time, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Ray Mabus, had um, advocated for more partnerships with uh, Pacific Asian nations, particularly Singapore. Simultaneously, he had designated Admiral Carr as the lead for the Navy's investment in STEM activities. And so this was the kindergarten through high school type of activities. And we ran a workshop in which um, Bill Nye, the science guy, came. So we bounced some ideas off of him. Additionally, about that same time, I was interested in this boat, the Wave Adaptive Modular Vessel. I had also been participating in RoboSub and had started the RoboBoat competition with the uh, RoboNation because I observed for the RoboSub competition that most of the teams were made up primarily of electrical engineers and computer scientists. Very few of them paid a lot of attention to Bernoulli or Archimedes. They didn't understand hull form efficiency. Uh, they didn't understand propulsion at all. But they could put enough power in their vehicle 
keep it watertight for the 15 or 20 minutes at the depth they needed to go to compete in the robo sub competition. And we created the robo boat competition so that students would really have to think more about systems engineering, about the interface between the air surface and the water, and that they would have to design a boat that uh, integrated all of the sensors in a more meaningful way that included mechanical engineers as part of, or naval architects as part of their discipline. I have a little story, and I don't want to embarrass the University of Michigan. Sorry, James. I told him the story the other day. Um, the naval architects came, and their first year, they, they had a wonderful trimaran hall for them. They had reverse bucket water jets for thrusters. They, they had uh, wonderful powering and resistance curves and had done all kinds of tests back at their home university. And they, none of their electronics worked. So the second year, I suggested that perhaps they wanted to involve an electrical engineer or a computer scientist on their team, and they did. And they didn't pay attention to the fact that these two gentlemen brought significant payloads to the table, and that when they showed up at the competition, they had about an inch of freeboard. And when they got up on plane, they swamped their electronics. So from that, they learned that electronics and water don't do very well working together. That third year, they showed up with a completely new hall form that had, was very stable. It was a swath hall form. They uh, had plenty of payload capacity. They had plenty of propulsion, and they won the competition. But it took them three years to figure that out. I didn't want students to waste a lot of time with the platform design. And therefore, I put forward the idea of all having a universal platform from which to start. And the design element would be developing the control system and the propulsion system. So this was an ideal platform. We also were thinking about not just having the surface vessel, but uh, launching and recovering underwater vehicles, launching and recovering aerial vehicles. This platform was inherently stable, and in its <laughs> uh, form, it offered an opportunity perhaps to be a perfect launch and recovery vehicle for the other domains, and eventually we could work with the other domains. So I settled on this vessel, and that was my reasoning behind it. Next slide. Okay. The other thing I had was a wonderful relationship with Daryl and the AUVSI Foundation, and they had a tremendous amount of experience in air competitions, ground vehicle competitions, in uh, st younger student remotely operated vehicle competitions. And I thought that if anybody could help pull this together, they would be the ones to do it. Um, I urge you to look at their website and see all of the other things they're involved with, but all of those are stepping stones to what we wanted this competition to be, to bring all of those things together. The other thing is that because we wanted to work with multiple nations, we were very sensitive to cultural differences and cultural sensitivities. And we didn't want to go in and tell another nation how they should form their teams or who they should select. And so we started off initial visits. I'll get to the next slide. But the idea was that it would be like the Olympics. And each nation would pick, pick their own gymnastics team. Within a certain rule set, um, they were uh, allowed to do that. It worked out quite well. And Daryl and I made the first of several visits overseas. We um, went to Seoul and met and uh, Daijan and met with uh, Seoul National University, KAIST, and CRISO. Uh, we went to Tokyo and visited the National Mar Maritime Research Institute, and they agreed to establish international or national coordination bodies and select their teams. Uh, we started off uh, visiting CSIRO, and I believe Matthew Dumbaben was with them at the time. He later joined QUT as a professor, and we um, developed a relationship with David Battle uh, at DST and Helen Dorsett. We also, um, the Office of Naval Research worked with various naval uh, labs, laboratories, uh, uh, the surface warfare centers and the undersea warfare centers, and uh, of course the Ministry of Defense in Singapore. We limited it to three teams from each nation, and I think this was a consequence that Singapore is a, 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 a small city nation, and they had three eligible universities, and we thought that that would be a good number. Also, 15 was probably all we could handle at the time. 
Uh, you see before you a list of schools that participated. We did allow teams to partner, and in Australia, Flinders partnered with the Australian Maritime College in Tasmania. In the United States, MIT partnered with Olin, and uh, Florida Atlantic University partnered with Villanova. So, what did we do for the teams? Uh, initially, we provided them a boat. We gave them a $25,000 stipend to help them develop their propulsion system and control system. Uh, we uh, assisted them with shipping. Throughout the process, I learned that some teams were going to use a boat to ship their vehicle to Singapore, um, knowing that that would take maybe six weeks. They would be without their boat for the final six weeks. And we decided that we would support everybody being able to ship by air so they could keep the vehicle, the vessel, as long as possible and work on it up to the last minute. The teams were responsible. And also, um, Singapore was very helpful. They uh, had a, an organization that helped support all the export licensing that we needed to bring in these vehicles for a short period of time. And uh, we also did every single school. It was a world tour. Um, the teams were responsible, as I said, for propulsion and control. Uh, sensor development and algorithm uh, development, integration of the systems on the platform. They were responsible for their travel expenses and all of their logistics coordination. It's a list of the cities that Daryl and I uh, visited in preparation. We wanted, each, we wanted to see each of the student bodies, student teams in action. We wanted to inspect for safety. We wanted to plant seeds and ideas uh, for the future. And we wanted to help them, support them resourcing all of their activities. We gave them um, little bits of wisdom that we had gathered throughout the years that there's this wonderful website called you know, robosub.org and roboboat.org, and there are years worth of journal papers from which you might learn something and employ that. Uh, we told them that their university was not just an engineering department, that there were uh, English departments that could help them write papers, there were uh, business schools that could help them market, there were um, you know, very creative departments that could help them develop good videos, and that they shouldn't just rely on their engineering uh, departments at their eyes to learn that. Uh, we also encourage partnership with industry, and some of them were surprised to learn that as well. So these visits were valuable to us, but I think valuable to the student teams as well. So we got to the competition in Singapore, and um, we, the Singaporean uh, Ministry of Defense, in conjunction with the um, National University of Singapore, put on a tremendous event. Uh, it was very daunting to the other schools to look at. They had a, a tech expo. They had invited a significant number of dignitaries. They had a tremendous opening ceremony. And there um, were people of uh, great importance there. And everybody knew that it meant something to be at that event. One of the limitations was the size of the venue we were at. We only had two full courses. So that meant teams only had a limited amount of time in the water every day. Uh, the only way to get in the water from the platform was to be launched by a crane, and that was sometimes a bottleneck in the process, and there was limited uh, time to be in the water. Um, I do note that I put in the winning team from MIT Olin, so the usual suspects are at the bottom, and if you want to know what that feels like, Mike Benjamin, who is part of that team, is here, and he can talk to you about that. So as we move forward, um, we expanded the number of teams that we invited. And in fact, uh, in Hawaii, these are the teams that came. Um, but initially, there were some 24 teams that expressed strong interest, 20 teams that had boats. And in the last 90 days or so, they began to peel off. Well, we were heartened that we weren't providing a stipend. There were other things that we weren't doing. And we were still sustaining the interest. But in the end, we were from 15 teams down to 13 teams. There were a fair number of US teams there. There was only one team from Korea, only one team from um, Japan. We want to do something to improve those numbers. Next slide. So as you can see, we used the same vehicle, but the difference was we did not provide the WAMV. 
However, if a, a, a team owned a WAMV and wasn't going to participate and wanted to gift their WAMV to someone else, they were permitted to do that. Um, they had to uh, add a buoyancy pod for safety to their vehicle, which some of them hadn't done that first year. Uh, they had to, uh, all financial considerations were on them. And still we had 13 teams manage to come all the way to Hawaii. The difference between that venue and Singapore was this was an open water environment. We were right on the beach. We launched the boats every day off a boat ramp. And once you were in the water, you could stay in the water on a course all day long. You didn't have to bring your boat out of the water to work on it. You could just pull up to the beach, as depicted here, and work on your vehicle. So we gave teams a lot more access to water, uh, thinking that that would improve their performances overall. And in the end, the University of Florida was the winning team. And Seoul National University had the most consistent performance throughout um, the competition and earned a special judges award for that. So we, wanted, we did some lessons learned, some internal evaluation of what was the difference between the two competitions and how could we improve participation and performance going forward. We decided that two-year cadence of getting together was um, probably a little bit too long and that we wanted to get together annually and we hit on the idea of the forum. Now, Daryl and I can travel everywhere in the world. It's not pretty, it does, it's not as glamorous as it sounds, but we're willing to do it. And when we do it, we get a great deal of input from you, but that message is not shared with the entire group. It comes through the filter of us. And bringing you all together in a forum allows us all to participate together. It allows us to assimilate ideas and crowdsource things that would not occur otherwise. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, the one thing you can never do, no matter how intelligent or well-intentioned, is to make a list of those things that would not occur to you. Or if you get a lot of smart people in a room together, they began to mix and match ideas and bubble up with things that didn't occur to either one of them except by that seed they planted together. We wanted, over the next two days, discuss lessons learned. We appreciate criticism as well as um, praise. We um, want to talk about the new rules. We want to talk about, uh, well, uh, what did we learn at the, Ro the Ross tutorial yesterday, which was, uh, by all accounts, amazing. So thank you again, Brian. Uh, we want you to network. We want um, to socialize the idea of a virtual competition. Uh, we want to... Um, provide a venue for research that is being done using the WAMV to be published and, and made knowledge. Uh, we want to give students an opportunity to publish their work, and so we will be issuing a special edition of an IEEE OES journal. Uh, so thank you all that contributed to that. We will have a, um, a top paper uh, award uh, tomorrow afternoon uh, based on the student presentations today. And we will um, likely be announcing awards of uh, new WAMV platforms. We have a few that we can award, and we've accepted some applications, and um, we'll be making an announcement on that tomorrow. The next Maritime uh, Robotics Challenge, I'm happy to be say, say, will be held in Hawaii again. Uh, that uh, accomplishes a number of tasks. It gets us past uh, the learning curve of a new venue. Uh, many of you don't know this, but in November 2016, we were contacted by the Army Corps of Engineers and told that we had not passed all of the check boxes that we thought we had passed for environmental compliance and everything else for the state of Hawaii. We had met all the state of Hawaii over the year and a half that we were doing that, but by virtue of this being funded by a federal organization, the Office of Naval Research, we triggered a lot of federal requirements. They usually take about a year to get through. We had to do a bathymetric survey. We had to do uh, many other things. And it's not just the fisheries and, and the protected species. It's also the indigenous populations and perhaps burial zones and, and other things. But uh, miraculously, and thanks to the very hard work of uh, University of Hawaii and Navitech, a company in Hawaii, we were able to successfully navigate and I believe on December 7th, we got the final federal bodies. So that, that was uh, 
you know, touch and go. But now that we've done that, let's take advantage of it and stay in Hawaii one more year. Amir is going to present in his session later this afternoon what uh, long-range plans are. We're looking for somebody to step up and host the next forum. We'll support you every step of the way. We're doing the first one in Australia, but we'd be interested very much in, in doing something in Japan or in Korea. So think about who's first, okay? <laughs>